Right. It's uh, always a pleasure to be with you, although it's a virtual visit rather than an in-person visit. And we hope we can change that in the future. And my topic this morning is early onset sepsis, uh, finding a needle in a haystack. Um, and it's one of my favorite topics to speak about in neonatal medicine. I bring you greetings from my hospital. Um, you see the newest portion of my hospital on the left part of the screen. It's called uh, the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital at Columbia University. Um, and the NICU is located next to the top floor. Now we have a modern uh, newborn ICU, as you might imagine, with the latest technology. And across the country and maybe across the, wor the world, we're known for our lowest rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and our use of non-invasive ventilation. But in our country, we're also known for having the best looking faculty. Uh, and here we are. Uh, I can't hear your laughs, but this may look like uh, someone you know from our country. Uh, and when I was a fellow though, I trained at Columbia. And when it came to a baby, who might have sepsis, I would call that a no-brainer, which means that we just sort of did things automatically. We started those babies on uh, penicillin and countamycin and treated them for five days after a blood culture. And in fact, most babies got better. Now, we knew that aminoglycosides had a, um, a toxicity associated with them, uh, both ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. But we never dreamed that certain combinations of antibiotics might actually increase infant mortality. And that's certainly true about the third generation cephalosporins. And the concept of dysbiosis hadn't been developed yet, it certainly is now. And a change in the microbiome of the newborn infant has been associated with a increased risk of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and necrotizing enterocolitis and late onset sepsis. What we didn't realize at the time, but we should have realized it, is that indiscriminate use of antibiotics or using them freely, prol prolonged hospitalizations and increased expenses, and I'll show you an economic analysis in a second, separated mothers and babies, which interfere with breastfeeding and clearly interfere with bonding, and led to unnecessary procedures uh, and a risk of IV infiltration which is not a trivial one. It's fairly common in all of our NICUs. This is the economic analysis I, I just mentioned. This is by Malloy in 2014, uh, who said the cost in the United States to prevent one death of a baby by admitting and treating every infant exposed to chorioamunitis for 48 hours would be $10 million. That's just our country. And these are data from 2014. And as you know, many uh, international societies have recommended that we treat uh, every infant exposed to maternal chorioamunitis. Let me start with uh, some numbers. Um, first of all, sepsis overall is an uncommon disease. The incidence varies from country to country, uh, but in general, it ranges from a half up to one per thousand live births. Obviously, if you're looking at a higher risk population, for example, babies born to mothers with chorioamunitis, the number can be higher. In well-appearing term and late preterm infants, the instance of early onset sepsis is quite low. It's only about one in 25,000. Sepsis workups, as you know, are far more common than infants who have a positive blood culture. And half of all sepsis workups, at least estimated, are for clinical symptoms with babies with non-infectious diseases. Now, the story in preterm babies is a little more serious. About three quarters of deaths from all early onset sepsis occurs in our VLBW babies less than 1,500 grams. Almost 90% of VLBWs receive broad spectrum antibiotics for possible sepsis because nobody wants to miss a baby with sepsis. Prolonged antibiotic therapy is used in about a third of those ELBW babies. And we know that prolonged antibiotic therapy, which is defined as more than five days, has been associated with increased risks of death, chronic lung disease or BPD, late onset sepsis, and necrotizing enterocolitis. 
So the question we ought to think about is how do we identify the infant with clinical signs or risk factors is actually affected? That gets back to my original slide is like finding a needle in a haystack from all the other symptomatic babies who are not infected. And the correlate to that is, can we safely decrease antibiotic exposure in newborn babies who are at lower risk of sepsis? And these are the main opportunities. One is healthiest appearing late preterm and term babies who are at least 35 weeks gestation with any risk factor infection. And that includes chorioaminitis. So that's a population that probably doesn't need to receive antibiotics at birth. And the second population are preterm babies of any gestational age with no risk factors for infection, born by electrocesarian section for maternal indications such as uh, preeclampsia with, the, with either artificial rupture membranes or rupture membranes at delivery. Again, that's a very low risk population. So there are two methods that have competed for how we can decrease antibiotic exposure in our late preterm and term population who have risk factors for sepsis. There's the sepsis calculator, which I'll speak about in some detail, uh, that's, that's accompanied by zero observations. And then there's a, there's a protocol of just doing zero observations and not using the sepsis calculator. Remember the sepsis calculator takes into account clinical signs and symptoms. And again, we'll talk about that in a moment, where zero observations starts with the population of babies who are well appearing, but who then develop signs and symptoms and are started on antibiotics following a blood culture. Now, whenever we talk about any topic, we'd love to hear about evidence. We like Cochrane reviews. And there's a famous saying that goes, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So, and that was uh, said by Carl Sagan, an astrophysicist, so not every topic we find in neonatology is supported by clear-cut clear randomized clinical trials, but it does not mean that the observational trials are incorrect. And I've often said in rounds in my NICU is that evidence is not all it's cracked up to be. We have to accept wise scholars and observational data in our management of babies. Now, as you know, babies can get infected by four different pathways. Two of them are very uncommon, including retrograde infection from abdominal cavity or infection introduced at the time of amniocentesis. And two of them are much are more common. One is hematogenous dissemination through the placenta. Those are the so-called torch infections that, uh, that can infect newborn babies during fetal life. And then there are ascending infections from the vagina and the ascending infections lead to a chorioamnionitis. The new term is really intraamniotic infection. And chorioamnionitis or intraamniotic infection is a key step in the pathway of early onset sepsis. So how much of it is, is it as a risk factor? So it, it depends on gestational age. In the population of babies we're gonna be speaking about for much of this lecture, in a mother born, in a baby born to a mother with chorioamnionitis, the risk of its sepsis is relatively low it's probably 1% or less. On the other hand, if you look at a very immature population, and these are data from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network of babies 22 to 28 weeks of station, that relationship is much stronger. So at 28 weeks, about 14% of the women have clinical core immunitis, and one out of 14 develops early onset sepsis. And at the very lowest limits of viability, um, at 22 weeks, which some centers are practicing, the instance of clinical chorioamnitis is about 28%, and about a fifth of those babies will develop early onset sepsis. The definition of chorioamnitis, or what we call intraamniotic infection, is important because it determines how we manage those babies. And there are a series of national and international guidelines, which goes something like this, that if a mother, if a baby's asymptomatic, but the mother has choreo, most national guidelines recommend a blood culture at birth with or without laboratory testing and begin broad spectrum antibiotics. These were the recommendations of the Committee of Fetus and Newborn in the US, 
the NICE guidelines as part of the UK, and also the CDC guidelines. And I participated in several of the US guidelines. And for that, I'm gonna say, I'm sorry, because at the time we, we wrote those guidelines, we thought it was the best practice, but it is probably not. And what were the, comp the consequences of those guidelines, CDC, fetus and newborn and NICE guidelines? It led to increased workups for sepsis in babies who were totally well appearing, prolonged antibiotic therapy solely based on lab values. I always say that I never decide about who to treat or not to treat based on lab values and increased length of stay on unnecessary invasive procedures, especially lumbar puncture through the NICE guidelines. So the question is, can we diagnose intraamniotic infections or choreamniotis with better precision, therefore we'll end up treating fewer babies? Well, there are lots of definitions for choreamniotis. Most of them are not very practical. For example, at the top is histologic choreamniotis, looking at the placenta, it's a great idea, but most of the data from birth doesn't come back for several days. We can look at elevated cytokines in amniotic fluid. Again, not very practical. We can look for positive culture PCR from amniotic fluid, not generally done. And therefore, we commonly rely on maternal symptoms of choreamniotis or intraamniotic infection, fever, tachycardia, high white blood count, uterine tenderness, fetal tachycardia are all signs of choreamunitis. In 2017, there was an important document published by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which redefined um, choreamunitis or intraamniotic infection. And that was based on a workshop I led at the NIH uh, in the preceding year. So they identify three categories of possible infection. The first is not infection, it's isolated maternal fever. That's a fever of 38 to 39 with nothing else. And for example, with an epidural, you can see a fever of, uh, in that range that's not due to infection. Then there's a category of suspected intraamniotic infection, which is a fever greater than 39 or 38 to 39 with one additional clinical risk factor, such as a high maternal white blood count, purulent drainage from the cervical os or fetal tachycardia. And finally, there's a, there's a category of confirmed intraamniotic infection based on a positive amniotic fluid test consistent with infection or evidence of placental infection or inflammation. So let me show you a case. I'm going to ask how you manage this baby. We're going to have to do it virtually. This is baby Kim delivered a 37 and 2 7th week gestation. So it's an early term gestation but there was prolonged rupture of membranes for 26 hours. In addition, the mother was culture positive for GBS, root B streptococcus, and received intrapartum antibiotics, ampicillin, genomycin, but just two and a half hours prior to delivery, and she had a low-grade fever, which was significant of 38. The baby was suctioned and dried by the nurse and placed on CPAP, which is what we do at Columbia, with just room air. APGAR scores were pretty good, and the respiratory distress went away and the CPAP was discontinued. And I think I have a picture of baby Kim in our nursery. Oh, there he is, looking very alert and active. And the question is, how would you manage this baby? And the choices are supportive care, no antibiotics, testing your cultures, and really just watching the baby, getting a blood culture and using broad spectrum antibiotics, or do screening laboratory tests, white blood count, CRP, and blood culture. And I know you're thinking about the answer. The one I like the best is A, and I'll provide a rationale for that in a second. But for those of you who are following some of the guidelines from NICE guidelines or from the CDC, you might say to yourself, this mother has choreamunitis and do a blood culture and start broad spectrum antibiotics. When I get a baby admitted to the NICU, I ask myself two questions if there's a risk of sepsis. Is the baby symptomatic or asymptomatic? And what are the various risk factors? So if a baby is critically ill and symptomatic, that's a no brainer. I think we're all going to treat that baby with antibiotics. If the baby is well appearing, but there's risk factors for sepsis, you have some choices. You might decide to observe that baby or 
you might do some diagnostic testing to help you make the decision. Or if it's a preterm baby, you might actually decide to treat that baby. But there's a third group of babies that we have to think about. And those are babies who do not have risk factors but are and are not critically ill, but they're symptomatic. What do you do? What I do is wait because many babies will go through a physiologic transition. And in four to six hours, those babies will be clinically asymptomatic. So I observe those babies. If they continue to be symptomatic, then I might do diagnostic testing to decide who needs treatment. But I, I have a very low threshold for treatment if my diagnostic testing is abnormal or the babies are becoming progressively more ill. Or if the diagnostic testing is normal and the babies have minimal signs and might decide on no treatment. So if you pick up most textbooks and it's one of the risk factors for sepsis, you see a list that looks like this. And on the right is the incidence of proven sepsis. So if there's prolonged rupture membranes for 18 hours, the risk of sepsis is about 1%. If there's combinations of risk factors, such as prolonged rupture membranes in a preterm baby or low APGAR score, the risk can be as high as 4 to 6%. And I want you to look at where the arrow is here. If the mother's group B strep positive and she has signs of choreo, the risk can be as high as 20%. But these babies are all symptomatic. When we wrote the old guidelines, we didn't realize that it's the symptomatic babies that have a high incidence of proven sepsis. So now we're going to get to the sepsis uh, score or sepsis algorithm. And it was initially developed by Gabriel Escobar and Gar Karen Popolo. And they did a study of babies greater than 34 weeks gestation. Uh, they identified babies with sepsis in the first 72 hours of life. They had 350 babies and about 1,000 controls. And what made this study use un unique is say, instead of using cutoff values, such as prolonged rupture membranes for 18 hours or maternal fever of 38 degrees or 100.4, they treated those risk factors as continuous variables. And I'll show you that in a second. But importantly, about a third of the infants with positive cultures were asymptomatic in the first 12 hours of life. So here is the risk of sepsis according to your gestational age. The black line is the actual data from their study. The red line is the smoothed out data. And the dotted line is the incidence of chorioaminitis in their population, which is about 0.5 per thousand live birth. And you can see it's a U-shaped curve. The risk of sepsis goes out, goes up with what we call post-term gestations, and it goes up also if the baby's born as a late preterm baby. And this is a similar graph looking at duration of ruptured membranes. And you can see here, uh, the, the risk of sepsis goes up with 18 hours. That's the classic definition of ruptured membranes or prolonged rupture membranes, but it goes up even earlier. So there are shorter durations of ruptured membranes associated with an increased risk of sepsis. And with very prolonged duration of ruptured membranes, the risk goes even higher. And this is the risk of sepsis according to maternal temperature. 100.4 is often the definition of a high maternal temperature, but the higher the maternal temperature, the greater the risk of early onset sepsis. So they took those risk factors and developed a sepsis score based on gestational age, weeks and days, the highest maternal temperature, duration of ruptured membranes, the mother's GBS status, positive, negative, or uncertain, whether she received treatment for that or just broad spectrum antibiotics, and were they given four hours prior to delivery. And if you go back to baby Kim and plug in all the values, which I've done for you, the answer comes out to a predicted probability of sepsis of 1.61 per thousand live births. And if you think that the baseline risk factor is 0.5, is clearly elevated, that's a baby that the sepsis screen would say, get a blood culture or perhaps get some diagnostic test, diagnostic test, but not treat. And then Dr. Popolo and Dr. Escobar, using a similar database, incorporated the baby's clinical signs with those historical risk factors. So they had a pretest probability of sepsis based on the historical data. And then they looked at the baby's clinical presentation 
I came up with a new probability of sepsis. And that's a form, as you know, of Bayesian analysis. And there are three groups of babies based on clinical signs. A group who was well, a group who had equivocal presentation, and they define that pretty specifically in their paper, but it's mild in those. And then there are babies, they said, were really sick. So if we take baby Kim and say the baby's well, the risk of sepsis is quite low. It's only 0.66 per thousand live births. And you probably do nothing rather, or just observe the baby. If the baby was symptomatic, but not very sick, the risk of sepsis with a similar risk factors goes up to about eight, quite high. And if the baby is really sick, the risk of sepsis is quite high at 33. So I'm gonna end by speaking about some controversies and then look at the various ways of using the sepsis score or clinical observation. First question, does early on sepsis occur in babies with risk factors who appear completely well? And the answer is yes, we know that already. Does suspected intraamnionic infection in the mother mandate treatment of all newborn infants? The answer you're gonna see is no. And how effective are serial observations versus a sepsis calculator? So first question, what's the risk of sepsis in a baby who looks well to you? In a well-appearing term and late preterm baby, the risk of sepsis is reduced by 60 to 70%, but it is not zero and some babies will become symptomatic. And the best study on that topic was done by this, the NICHD in Wortham from the CDC. It was a retrospective observational study of about 230 symptomatic and asymptomatic babies, all of whom had a positive blood or CSF culture, and all those women had chorioamnionitis. And about half the women had both clinical and histologic chorioamnionitis. The rest had various combinations of clinical and histologic. As it turns out, 96%, almost every preterm baby was symptomatic who had positive blood or CSF culture, but only three quarters of the term babies were symptomatic and five term babies eventually became symptomatic within 72 hours of birth. So the term population may more likely or has a possibility of being asymptomatic where all of our preterm babies were symptomatic. And this is important. All infants who died were symptomatic within six hours of birth. Therefore, your early physical examination is a great way to predict mortality. Now let me go to the recommendations of the Committee of Fetus and Newborn. These are the latest recommendation for babies uh, who are at least 35 weeks of station. As a, as a few generalizations, no method, whatever you use, can identify all babies who are going to have sepsis with precision. Each strategy has merits and limitations, and each strategy must include measures to monitor the baby and minimize the duration of antibiotic therapy. And every center has to choose what strategy is best for them. So what they call categorical risk assessment, this is the old CDC NICE guidelines. Um, and I don't like it, but they allowed it to be one of the options. And they based it on whether the baby is well appearing or has clinical chorioamnionitis. And that population, they recommended lab testing and appear for antibiotics. If the baby, however, is just colonized with GBS and the mother received in inadequate intrapartum therapy with a duration of ruptured membranes for 18 hours, or a baby is less than 37 weeks, they said lab testing. Again, I think it's pretty worthless, but that was a recommendation. If the mother's caused with GBS, but just receive inadequate treatment, they say, okay, you can just observe those babies. So it's the old CDC NICE guidelines, which I think are suboptimal. And then there's a sepsis calculator based on a cohort of over 600,000 babies. As you see, it uses objective information at birth and the first six to 12 hours of life. And they recommend a blood culture and enhanced clinical observation if the risk is greater than one per thousand live births or less than three. And then any baby with a risk of sepsis greater than three, they recommend antibiotics. The limitations of the sepsis calculator are significant. The sepsis calculator misses a substantial portion, proportion of babies who actually have sepsis, estimated at 40% and recommends treatment of over 200 babies for each case of confirmed sepsis. Infants with an equivocal presentation and a calculated score greater than one but less than three require a blood culture and an assessment every four hours for the first 24 hours of life. Blood cultures have a poor sensitivity in that setting. And the definition of an equivocal presentation 
is likely to overlap with that of a well-appearing baby, depending on when assessments are made. But the calculator has reduced and peer for antibiotic therapy. This is a recently published meta-analysis in JAMA Network, which shows a substantial reduction in the number of babies um, who are receiving antibiotics and even those exposed to core immunitis. And then there's zero observations. Basically, observations are made in a sequential fashion up through 48 hours, and babies are treated who develop signs of illness that might be related to sepsis. And this is sort of what I call the gold standard of how to observe babies. And it comes from the Stanford group. And this is the article published in Journal of Pediatrics in 2020, in which all postpartum nurses are educated about signs of sepsis and the importance of repeated clinical assessments. A hospital, a hospitalist attends all delivery and assesses every baby. And then a level two nursery nurse makes assessments every 30 minutes for the first two hours of life then every four hours for the first 24 hours of life, and then every eight hours. And well-appearing babies, no matter what the risk factors are, who are more, or at least 35 weeks of station, are admitted directly to the postpartum unit for rooming in with the mother. And this is the recently published paper by Fromar, and here's before they introduced their zero observation, and here are three phases, and we're talking about the sustainability phase, which is data on over 10,000 babies showing that it decreased antibiotic use, decreased use of ampicillin, and decreased the use of laboratory testing. So here's my conclusions. Babies with clinical signs of sepsis should receive empirical antibiotics, there's no question. Asymptomatic late preterm and term infants with risk factors of sepsis, including what I call intraamniotic infection of core immunitis, can be closely observed without empiric therapy and or evaluated using a sepsis calculator plus some other um, mode of frequent observations. There are groups of preterm babies who had very low risk of infection who could be managed without antibiotics. For example, babies born by a lactose cesarean section. And can select group of symptomatic babies be managed without receiving antibiotics? It's an open question and we're doing now a randomized clinical trial of withholding antibiotics in symptomatic babies who are not critically ill and not born to move with the core immunitis, but that study is in its early phases. Here's my final slide. The blood culture for baby Kim was negative, and because of the unremarkable laboratory values, the baby was only treated for 48 hours. As baby Kim grew up, he decided to style and color his hair differently, and believe it or not, became, a, became president of the United States, defeating a well-known celebrity. And here's baby Kim, and you see with a different haircut, uh, which is used by one of our current politicians. He looks pretty likable. And here's our current president with baby Kim's haircut, who looks totally non-likable. And again, I want to thank Junaid and thank you all uh, for listening to this talk. I'm sorry it has to be virtually, but I, I, I've enjoyed visiting the Middle East and Abu Dhabi, and I hope to do it again in the future. Thank you very much.